Bows and TKOs, we are live, episode 15, coming at you from the valley, from the desert on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon as I get ready to head to jiu-jitsu, catch uh, the new Dana White Contender Series post-jiu-jitsu, and uh, we have a good show. I'm your host, Shane Gillette. We're episode 15 since the rebrand to the MMA-only show, Bows and TKOs. Uh, we'll start with some MMA matchups. Not a lot of action when it comes to news or, or new newly announced matchups. And then we will break down UFC 293 and preview the UFC Fight Night card that is happening um, in uh, T-Mobile. Uh, not at the Apex little UFC um, Las Vegas action. But before we do that... Um, What a weird world that we have woken up to this week that we have Sean Strickland as a UFC champion over one of the most glorified fighters of all time in Israel, Atisanya. We have Sean O'Malley as a UFC champion. How much crazier can this year get? I think um, I saw an article or saw something on Twitter about how many UFC champions have fallen this calendar year and how many guys have been in reign forever that aren't. We have Pantoja as the flyweight champion, Sean O'Malley as the bantamweight champion, Volk's the only guy holding strong, Islam, although, you know, he's dominant, he's somewhat newer, Leon Edwards dethroning Kamaru Usman, Sean Strickland, currently Jamal Hill, uh, to be determined what happens there, and the GOAT, John Jones at heavyweight. What a year, man. What a year. So some new fights that are booked coming up. They're starting to fill out the UFC Fight Night card October 7th. It looks like we will have a week off of MMA for the first time in quite some time here at the end of September as we roll into October. But we have Grant Dawson, Bobby King, main eventing the October 7th Apex card. That is going to be a scrap. We got Jared Gordon and Mark Madsen booked for UFC 295, uh, which is uh, going to be a fun matchup as well. We have Alex Morano and Joaquin Buckley, October 7th. So you got Grant Dawson, Bobby King, Green, Alex Morano, uh, Joaquin Buckley, Carolina Kowalsiewicz, and Diana Belbita, October 7th. So some really fun matchups happening there, some evenly leveled matchups. We got Terrence McKinney, Chris Duncan, October 14th. Uh, T-Rex being as active as ever, as always. And then we had uh, the Junior Dos Santos, uh, Fabricio Verdum, BKFC, or BK, bare knuckle event for Jorge Masvidal's bare knuckle promotion. I did not catch the fight, didn't realize it was free, kind of wish I did, saw some highlights, looked like a blast as Game Bread's doing his bare knuckle, his boxing events, and putting on quite the promotional shows. But let's break into the chaos of UFC 293. I went 5-4 and four on my picks. I mean, with the Izzy fight, I really did not expect that, but I'm still above 500 in a chaotic card. Not mad about it. For Bows and TKOs, we're 88-56 and 56 so far. Hey, we're still plus 30. Make it 32. Let's keep adding to that streak this weekend. Some good fights we did not break down. Kevin Jusse had a round one submission victory early via rear naked choke. And so did Gabriel Miranda um, getting the local Shane Young submitted after a big weight cut issue and uh, looking jacked. Uh, he got his back, made, the, made it look like slight work. But we're going to kick this thing off in the prelims. We had Nas. Oh, yeah. And by the way, I talked about Sean O'Malley being the bantamweight champion. Got my sugar merch. Got got to represent the the Montana stud, although he's very Arizonian, like I am now. Um, what an amazing story! What what an amazing just year in the UFC shows that anyone could do it. Uh, high school dropout Sean O'Malley 
Uh, Sean Strickland just went through a, a, a major motorcycle accident, you know, trying to come back into the fight game. Uh, has talked vocally about some of the mental health issues and things that he's gone through. What a world. Got to love the UFC. Got to love the sport. Anything is possible. Hard work and determination over everything. Speaking about hard work and determination in the prelims, we had Nazra Haparas with the unanimous decision victory over Landon Quinones. And this was about exactly the way I, I, I thought this fight would plan out. A good mix of um, kickboxing back and forth. Nasrat fighting a little bit out of desperation. And, and not the worst of ways. He's just taken some L's. He's shown he's a quality fighter. He's fought some quality opponents. And he had to put it on Landon. But Landon is tough. There's a reason he got an opportunity for this fight. He looks like he, he deserves uh, and belongs in the UFC. I'm excited to see what the next... Uh, you know, future looks like for Landon. He's still young with a ton of potential and taking on a very, very good Nasrat. And Nasrat, I, I would say first round was a lot closer than the other two rounds. Uh, Landon landed some big, powerful kicks, trying to earn his right in the center of the octagon. But Nasrat put him up against the cage and really just was doing his best Sean Strickland impersonation, uh, coming out with lots of one-twos, lots of kicks. He was going to will his way to a victory he was going to throw a lot more volume and do whatever he had to do to get that victory, and he did. I mean, statistically, these guys put on a show, 172 total and 171 significant strikes for Nazrat. He was 0 for 5 in takedown attempts, and Landon land, landed 152 total strikes, 148 of those significant. So they put on a lot of volume over the course of three rounds. Um, round one was better for Landon, and as it went through, Nasrat and his team put a good game plan, get in his face, make it happen. Uh, but what a UFC debut for Quinones. Uh, Nasrat extends his winning streak to two. He is three and two since 2021. Landon ends his five-fight winning streak in his UFC debut and starts a new losing streak. So I would love to see Nasrat fight Drakkar close in a return fight from an ACL injury. I think that would be a ton of fun. And for Landon, how about John Macdessey, who we'll talk about here in a minute, or Jai Herbert? I think those would be phenomenal next steps for him. And in the next fight, uh, you know, the Australians didn't quite clean house like the French did, obviously, with the headliner losing. But we had Jamie Malarkey with the unanimous decision over John Macdessey. And this was a very, very close fight. When it came to the judges' scorecards, I really had no idea... I figured Jamie won rounds one, round three, John winning round two. Um, but when it comes to damage, which the UFC, you know, puts in such a high regard, you could debate that John landed more damage with Jamie bloodying up his nose, getting his face bloodied up and looking damaging. Where, um, you know, John's a veteran. He's been there, done that. He's as tough as leather. Did not have a lot of those visible signs so i wasn't sure if that would sway the judges it didn't it did not and i'm not too opposed of that but jamie let me double check i want to say he's in his prime now or about to be i mean he's had an interesting career and i just feel like he has not put together the full package so he's 29 he is not technically in his ufc prime and it's just been wins losses wins losses um, his last fight before this, he lost to Muhammad Naimov. Uh, he beat Francisco Prado, beat Michael Johnson in a very close split decision. Lost to Jalen Turner, beat Devontae Smith, Kamal Worthy, lost to Ferris Ziam, Brad Riddell. So some of the better names he struggled, got some decent quality wins. Uh, the best win on that is Michael Johnson, which was a very close split decision. And Michael, you know, definitely isn't the prime of his career anymore. And... For Jamie to take that next step, he really needs to put on a good show. He got lucky. The scorecards went went his way. It'll be interesting to see what's next for Jamie and how he could put pull it all together because he just doesn't – he's a little slow on his punches. He's uh, afraid to take some risk. It's just it, – it's kind of uh, frustrating seeing him fight in there. But John's tough. He's fought in a lot of dudes. You know, he does not care. He's still out there going and enjoying the fight game. I mean, John – since 2020, has fought, has fought Francisco Trinaldo, veteran, a very good Ignacio Bahamondes, and um, Nazra Haparest, and Jamie Malarkey. So, very interesting situation there. 
Now, statistically, Jamie landed 88 total strikes and significant while going 0 for 2 in takedown attempts. John landed 85 total strikes and 83 of those significant, and he was 0 for 1 in his own takedown attempts. So Jamie does start a new winning streak. He is 3 and 2 since 2022, but I just feel like I hold him in higher regards. He has an opportunity to, to showcase more, but he's only 29. John extends his losing streak to two. He has not won since April of 2021, and that was a split decision victory. So what's next for these gents? I would love to see if John is still in the UFC. You know, why not Landon Quinones? That seems appropriate. Uh, fight for your UFC lives. And for Jamie, how about Ladovic Klein? I was thinking maybe Terrence McKinney, but he just got booked. So how about Ladovic Klein in his next step? And then this crazy uh, situation. I thought this fight, Chepe Mariscal and Jack Jenkins had fight of the night potential. Well, Chepe Mariscal gets a second round TKO, but it's because uh, Jack Jenkins dislocated his elbow, was nasty, was down and did not move immediately. I thought originally he just like completely blew out his shoulder, but it happened to be the elbow. And it was a very good back and forth affair in the first round. Chepe did land a little bit more volume. Statistically, over the course of the round and a half or so, Jack landed 43 total strikes, 41 of those significant. He was 0 for 1 in takedown attempts. And Chepe landed 87 total strikes, only 38 significant. A lot of that was some ground and pound while, while uh, Jack was down. And then he got a takedown on his only attempt. So Chepe extends his winning streak to 5. He's on a roll. Hate to have a win this way, but he is 2-0 and in the UFC. And Jack ends his brilliant nine-fight winning streak. He does start a new losing streak. He is 3-1 and one in the UFC, first loss. And brutal way to take an L. You know, I took the L on the picks, but, you know, I, I can't control that. Uh, Would have loved to see the fight play out. So what's next for these guys? I think Chepe and Lucas Almeida would be fun. And for Jack, how about Gavin Tucker or Sung Woo Choi, depending on the elbow, might be out for some time. But those would be the level of opponent I think would be appropriate for Jack. And then the two big, three big Aussies really putting the show on their backs. In the prelim headliner, we had Carlos Olberg with a third round submission over Dawoon Jung via rear naked choke. And I had picked Da. I thought he was going to be um, a, a great counter striker to Carlos's aggressiveness. And I think Da thought the same thing I thought about Carlos that he was going to initiate the fight, come out look, uh, looking aggressive early, and that was not the case. Um, I think that had Da a little shook. Um, both really round one didn't have a ton going on. Carlos landed some good leg kicks, uh, but really a lot of the momentum started picking up in round two, and uh, Da started you know pressuring Carlos and putting um, him on the back up against the cage, and Carlos was able to get some good counters. Once he was aggressive in the third round, Jung did have some good things going. He's still so young, has great experience against a lot of fighters. He just wasn't as aggressive as he needed to be. It's not like Carlos outclassed him by any means, uh, but he was able to pick him apart from the outside, and I think Da was just a little shocked by the way Carlos attacked this fight, which is uh, quite, quite a bit different than he has of late. So Carlos landed 91 total strikes, 81 of those significant. He did get a takedown. He was one for two. Uh, he did have a submission attempt and the knockdown. And Da landed 60 total strikes, 58 of those significant with the takedown of his own. He was one for two as well. So Carlos, great game plan, extends his winning streak to five. He is six and one in the UFC. Uh, Jung extends his losing streak to three. He hasn't won since November of 2021. He is now four, three, and one in the UFC. But... I, I've liked what I've seen from this kid. I mean, obviously, he needed to be more aggressive in this fight, but it's hard when Carlos hits like a fucking truck. He's only 29 years old, turns 30 in December. His three losses, Carlos Olberg, rear naked choke, Devin Clark unanimous decision was a hard-fought fight. I did knock out by Dustin Jacoby. Before that, he beat William Knight, beat Kennedy and Shekwaku, who's looked great. Um, so there, there's lots of potential there, especially in the shallow light heavyweight di division. But tough loss for him. Again, he's 4-3-1 in the UFC. I think he'll be okay. 
So what is next? Give me Carlos and Alonzo Menafield or Dominic Reyes, Reyes right in the top 15. Two heavy hitters. It doesn't get easier for, for, uh, from here for him. But I, I would love to see those bangers. And for, for Da, how about Nikolai Nigamaranu? I think that'd be a good scrap in the light heavyweight division as well. Jumping to the main card, Tyson Pedro with a round one knockout over Anton Tricoli. And I figured that Tyson was going to come and get the finish, and that was exactly the case here. It was great to see. Anton has gone through some adversity since the Contender Series fight, and getting an opponent like Tyson I just did not think would play out to his advantage. And that was the case. I mean, this was pretty short-lived. Tyson landed 16 total and significant strikes to Anton's 9 total and 8 significant. So Tyson now moves to 3-1 since 2022. Anton extends his losing streak to 3. He's 0-3 in the UFC since that Contender Series victory. So what's next? I would love to see Tyson fight Maxim Grishin. And for Anton, how about Ihor Pateria if he's still in the UFC after this? I know Dana loves his Contender Series guys and he's He's put him in a short notice affair, so I'm sure he'll be okay. In the flyweight division, the fight of the night, Manel Cop with a unanimous decision over Felipe Dos Santos. I mean, come on. Felipe came into this fight. He was supposed to fight in the contender series two weeks ago. His opponent terribly missed weight, so he got a short notice fight as Kaikara France pulled out due to injury to fight Manel Cop. He took the fight, 23 years old. Not only did he take the fight, he hung in there, he handled it, he took shots, he delivered shots, and he looked skilled for a 23-year-old fighter. Something about those shoot box, blonde hair Brazilians, man. Watch out, because Felipe earned a lot of fans. Um, this was like the Diego Lopes showcase, although Diego's a little bit older. Uh, this guy is going to be a problem in the flyweight division. Manel was pouring it on, landed big shots, but Felipe delivered a lot of shots as well and showed he could hang in there with some of the best. Um, statistically, Manel landed 116 total, 112 of those significant. He did have a takedown and a knockdown, but for all that ish he was talking, he did not put up the performance. I was expecting a finish. Uh, Felipe landed 101 total strikes, 99 of those significant. He was 0 for 5 in takedown attempts. So not too far from the volume of Manel, but Manel handed uh, him a couple bigger shots, had that knockdown. So Manel extends his winning streak to four. He does move up two spots to number eight, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, beating a 23-year-old unsigned fighter, but whatever. Um, Felipe ends a seven-fight winning streak, his first pro loss in his UFC debut. But with all the drama, the press conference leading into uh, it, the post fight, uh, interview in the octagon with, um, Daniel Manel is talking that ish. Let's just book him in Kaikara France. I think he's down for that. And for Felipe, how about CJ Vergara? First full UFC fight camp. This guy deserves some quality opponents. He put on a show. Then the co-main event we had, uh, I, I literally just skipped this fight. So backing up. We had Justin Taffo with a round one knockout over Austin Lane. 50 G's performance of the night. This fight went opposite. I thought Austin Lane's length would be too much. I figured both of these guys would be swinging heavy uh, duty punches uh, early to get the finish. Well, Taffo was able to get in range, walk Austin down, eat his punches, and put his lights out. It only took Taffo 11 total and significant. Lane had seven total and significant strikes of himself. So now Tafa extends his winning streak to three. He did have the no contest in between. And Austin ends his six-fight winning streak and starts a new losing streak. He is one and one in the UFC. Um, let's see. But it was great that at least Australia got some of the boys to get the dub, although it was a weird situation in the main event, which we'll get to. Um, obviously, uh, tied to Avasa not being able to get the job done, but Justin Taffa, slight work, Tyson Pedro, Carlos Olberg coming in with the win. Um, what do these guys do next? I would love to see Taffa take on Blagoy Ivanov if he's still in the UFC. 
Or maybe uh, Augusto Sakai, I don't believe, is in the UFC anymore either. Hmm. So maybe Marcos Rogeria de Lima, right outside the top 15 for him. And for uh, Austin Lane, we could give him somebody like uh, Carl Williams or Chris Barnett. Either way, uh, the power of Tafa got through the short uh, or the, the, the length of disadvantage he had, but this wasn't the case here. Alexander Volkov, round two submission via an Ezekiel choke over Ty to Avasa. And I was watching this at a bar. I did not pay for the pay-per-view, $5 cover fee. They do play the audio, but we're at a bar. It's super loud. You can't really hear what's going on. I had good, good visuals that was happening. I did not think that Volkov looked very good with his choke attempts in jiu-jitsu. I think he had just put down a beat down on Tai Tuovasa for a round and a half, tired him out. Any kind of choke was a good reason to tap. Maybe he did lock it in, was able to lean back with how long he was and get it in there, but it didn't seem like a very deadly choke, to be honest. And some of the attempts of him getting under Ty's chin were kind of laughable. But uh, statistically, well, before the stats... I mean, I had picked against Tai Tuavasa many of his fights recently and, 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 and ate a fat L, right? He's a lot like Tafa, short, big, stocky dude, throws heat with his hooks. But for very advanced technical strikers or guys that have length and manage, how are you going to get in there with the hooks, kind of putting your head down, eating shots to throw them? It's just not very sustainable. Um his run after a few bad losses. So he beat an older Andre Orlovsky, had three L's in a row to Junior Dos Santos, Blagoy Ivanov, and Sergey Spivak. A lot of grapplers there. So then he gets going. Knocks out Stefan Struve. Knocks out Harry Hunsucker, which is nothing to write home about. Knocks out Greg Hardy. He picks up some steam. Greg had a little bit of a pull there from the Contender Series. I watched UFC 269 in person. Thought Augusto Sakai would put him up against the gauge, dirty box, use his size to his advantage. That was not the case. Ty knocked him out. Shuey's galore. People are going crazy. Then he knocks out the Black Beast, and his stock is at an all-time high. They say, hey, put him in there with Cyril Gunn. He gets mopped. Uh, sorry, here's Sergey Pavlovich. Might even be better than Sir Cyril Gunn. Uh, d doesn't last very long there. And now gets a legend in Alexander Volkov, who's fought anyone and everyone and I just did not think he was going to be able to pull it off. And that clearly was the case. But he got, point being is he, he beat a lot of nobodies and they jumped him up in the rankings in the top five against Cyril Gaon. And now he's been, you know, getting knocked back to kind of where I think he belongs. He's at number eight now. Where um, Alexander Volkov has fought a lot of these dudes. So I'm not too shocked at how it went. It was a complete beat down though. Uh, tough to see for Ty. He's such a fan favorite fighter. I'm sure he'll come back better than ever. Um... But it was not the best night in the office. I mean, statistically, he only landed 30 total strikes. You know, 28 of those were significant. Volkov landed 107 total strikes, 93 of those significant. He had a submission and a knockdown, was 0 for 1 in takedown attempts. So, Volkov extends his winning streak to 3. He is uh, an impressive 5 and 2 since 2021. Been fairly active. Does move up one spot in the rankings to 6. And like I said, Ty extends his losing streak to three. He is four and three since 2021. So, he, you know, before the winning losing streak, he was hot. And he moves down two spots in the rankings to number eight. So the way I see the rankings, I don't expect Volkov to be able to fight up much. Pavlovich is kind of waiting around for probably John and Stipe to retire after this fight. So he'll be in for an interim. Cyril Gons right there. I say he fights Tom Aspinall. Why not? Um, I doubt they're going to put Volkov ahead of those dudes. So either you're fighting back or let's just take another legendary fight. The Black Beast looks back. Let's run it back. Let's see how the top of the division shakes out. Put on a fan favorite affair at the end of the year. And for Ty, how about Marcin Tibera? I think that would be a, a solid fight for him. Then the, the main event that shocked the world. I still can't believe this is coming out of my mouth. Sean Strickland with the unanimous decision over Israel Adesanya. Performance of the night. Welcome to the shit show the UFC is. Um, I mean, enough about the fight. This fight was a complete beatdown. Beat 
Um, I, I literally, the week before, said I don't even know why these guys are fighting. Izzy's just kind of letting them have this fight. And either Izzy didn't take it seriously or Sean Strickland really is that good. But after seeing Sean get KO'd in person by Alex Pajeda instantly, I did not think this Floyd Mayweather-esque defensive style with just a 1-2 with your chin up high was going to do it over Izzy. And not only did it do it, it he did it well. But all the after effects since, I've loved every moment of it. Um, Sean in the post interviews talking about I shouldn't even be here this is for all the misfits you know people love that shit uh he said Dana's probably like god damn it hit you know him in the brass like how did we let this happen we, we need to run it back and get this guy off the, t the the throne so to speak um but he is just a he's a dude he's a guy that loves to fight you know a agree with his little chaotic um comments and spurts of knowledge here and there on the internet uh, you know, you, you got to root for it, but I did not think this would ever be a competitive fight whatsoever. I mean, all chaos broke in round one. Sean is not known for a KO artist. Damn near finished Izzy. I think some refs potentially could have called that. I think after Izzy was saying the last time he, he got it called was a little early, played into the, the factor a little bit here. I'm shocked the guy who... Comes up with the best game plans, makes a theatrical stunt out of everything. The walkouts, the music, um, the press conferences. Did not change his game plan. Didn't look like he really wanted to be out there. Looked like he got tired out and fatigued by round five. Sean looked like he barely took a punch. Could have went a whole other five rounds. He literally beat one of the goats with a one-two. You know? And like the weird defense, like... What in the actual hell just happened? I, I, I'm just at loss for words. Like, I, I just don't know anything about fighting, apparently. Um, I just feel like you run that back again. It, it, there's no way that happens. But then I'm watching the MMA hour, and Curse Curtis is like, he does that to everybody. He completely dominated him. What is he going to do different? So um, Lots of question marks. The world's crazy. I'm just trying to enjoy the moment. I can't really conceptualize that Sean Strickland's the champion. I was completely wrong. I'll own that L. Looking at the stats, Izzy landed 94 total and significant strikes. Sean landed 137 total and significant. He had the knockdown. So Israel starts a new losing streak, loses the title again. No title defense to Chase Silva, who has 10 title defenses in the division. Um, it's going to be hard for him to catch him now. For Sean, he does extend his winning streak to three. He is four and two since 2022, one of the more active fighters on the roster. I just have a feeling there's going to be a rematch early 2023. Enough time for Izzy to get his ish together. The UFC seems like they want it. Izzy, I'm sure, wants it. I don't know. Maybe Izzy wants some time off that Sean gets a chance to defend it. You know, I think Izzy wants it back. I don't, you know, who Sean fight next? If it isn't Izzy, there's a few options. Does he win? Potentially not. So there, there's just a lot of weird things going on with this division right now. And I think the UFC wants to run it back. So that's what I'm going with. I think they run it back. And I will probably pick against Sean Strickland again. Um, but I, I just, all the things that Izzy's done and what we've seen of Sean in their careers, it's just like, how can I, I don't even know how to compare this in other sports terms. It's just, it's just wild. It is very wild. It's like when the Spurs and the Pistons were the best in the NBA, just fundamental basketball, good defense, no superstars, nothing flashy, just got the job done. That's what Sean Strickland did. Life in the UFC, but bravo, Sean Strickland. Enjoy the moment, man. Soak it in. What a fucking life we live in, man. This weekend, some good storylines on the main event for UFC Noche, Mexican Independence Day's UFC Fight Night Las Vegas. The main card at 7, prelims at 4 Pacific, both on ESPN+. Plus. Some decent fights that we won't be breaking down just because Marnik Mann from Montana is getting her UFC debut opportunity. She's a Contender Series alum, lost the fight. Uh, I'm assuming fought her tail off elsewhere and is getting an opportunity short notice on this card. Can't complain about that in T-Mobile. Uh, Lupi Godinez is taking on Elise Reed. That should be a solid quality fight. Fernando Padilla and Kyle Nelson, who came off a good victory. 
And then Daniel Zul Huber and Christos Giagos back in action. We won't break those down. We're, st we're starting in the prelims. One hell of a fight we have here. The women are owning this card. We have Tracy Cortez, 29 years old with a 10 and 1 record and the number 14 next to her name, taking on Jasmine Jostavicius, 34 years old with a 9 and 2 record and the number 15 next to her name. Very, very interesting fight in the division. Yes, they're at the edge of the top 15, but the way they've been fighting lately, it's really going to be fun to see how this shakes out. Both solid strikers. Both fighters have a ton of experience, have seen success, are rolling of late. You know, Tracy is coming off an injury, so as long as she's healthy, she's really going to look to uh, protect her spots in the top 15, and she's been lingering there for quite some time. Jasmine, after her last victory, has been thrown into the spotlight. Let's see how she can handle it. Tracy finds out, trains out a fight ready here in Arizona. She is on a 10-fight winning streak and is 5-0 in the UFC. She lost her pro debut and hasn't looked back ever since. Uh, she is a Dana White Contender Series and Invicta alum. Jasmine is on a two-fight winning streak. She's a Contender Series and Cage Fury alum. She is 4-1 in the UFC, and she does have a 2.5-inch reach advantage. Now, as long as Tracy is healthy, which, you know, she pulled out to the injury last time, I'm assuming she is, I think she's going to keep the winning streak going. She's going to be a little bit more of a faster and technical striker than Jasmine. But uh, Jasmine, man, she's going to have the power advantage, I believe, a little bit of a reach advantage. It's going to be interesting if either woman brings in grappling or if they keep, keep it as a kickboxing showdown. Uh, but I am going to take Tracy Cortez. I'm avoiding it on a parlay if possible, though this is a close fight. Moving on, this is uh, funny how this came to be. We have Roman Kapalov, 32 years old, with a 10-2 and two record and the number 14 next to his name, taking on Josh Fremd, 29 years old, with an 11-4 and four record. Now, Roman Kapalov originally filled in for a guy that got hurt in a fight. Uh, Chris Curtis got hurt against Anth uh, Anthony Hernandez, so insert Roman. Anthony Hernandez gets pulled out due to injury, so insert Josh Fremd. Um, you know, two weeks out, they get to come in on a, uh, uh, prelim headliner and Roman's been rolling. I just saw him in Salt Lake city. So it shall be a fun one. Breaking it down. Roman is a Southpaw fighter. He is on a very impressive three fight winning streak and is three and two in the USC UFC. He's a fight nights global alum and 10 of his 11 wins are via knockout. Josh trains out of factory X. He is on a two-fight winning streak. He is an LFA and Bellator alum. He is 2-2 two and two in the UFC. Four of his 11 wins are via submission. Four via knockout. So eight of his 11 wins are via finish. And he does have a three-inch leg reach advantage. Now, Roman's cruising, man. I cannot bet against this guy. I think he's going to be the better fighter here. I really wish he was fighting Anthony Hernandez up in the rankings. But, you know, this is what we get. I expect a highlight knockout from Roman Kapilov. I am putting him on the parlay. We marking that ish down, and we getting that bread. Moving on, in the main card, we have Raul El Nino Problema Rosas Jr., only 18 years old. He is 7-1 and one as a pro, taking on Terrence Ter Bear Mitchell, 33 years old with a 15-3 and three record. I am 31. I could not imagine fighting an 18-year-old, uh, let alone Terrence at 33. What, what a sport the UFC is becoming. Now, this really is all about the 18-year-old experiment. He moves on from a loss. He's a very well-rounded fighter looking to get back on the win winning track. His fight style is super aggressive. Last time, I think that cost him. He gassed himself out. Clearly, he's just been able to go and kind of steamroll guys, go get the takedown, find their back, choke them out. And uh, that wasn't the case last fight. So I'm interested to see if he changed up his game plan, if he's a little bit more uh, measured and calculated in his attack. Uh, but all eyes are going to be on the first round. Raul, he's a contender series alum. He is on a one-fight losing streak, but is 2-1 and one in the UFC, including the contender series win. And five of his seven wins are via submission. Now, Terrence is on a one-fight losing streak, which was his UFC debut. And before that, he was on an 11-fight winning streak in Alaska. 
Six of his 14 wins are via submission, eight via knockout. So all 14 of his wins via finish, that's impressive. Two of his three losses are also via knockout. Now, Terrence will be a more jiu-jitsu dominant opponent uh, for Raul than he's faced thus far. So it'll be interesting to see if he does try that uh, same game plan, if he's going to have an advantage in the grappling and BJJ. Either way, this will be a good measuring stick for El Nino Problema. I am picking him, but of avoiding him on a parlay, if possible. Then the fight that everyone wants to tune in for, man. I remember talking about this, well, thinking about this on my Matchmaker Monday on the socials at Bows and TKOs, Insta, Twitter. Could you imagine if they put this fight together? Well, they did. We got Kevin Trailblazer Holland, 30 years old with a 25-9 and record and the number 13 next to his name. Taking on Jack Della Maddalena, 27 years old with a 14 and 2 record and the number 14 next to his name. This has got to be fight of the night. Two very skilled young strikers who are going to put on a show. That's all Big Mouth, aka Trailblazer, aka Kevin Holland does. So that's what we're going to expect. Kevin's got a kung fu and BJJ background. He's got a second degree black belt in kung fu, a black belt in BJJ. Four of his last six fights have been fight of the night or performance of the night. He shows up and he shows out. He's a contender series, Bellator, LFA, and King of the Cage alum. He's been a lot of places. He's also tied for the most wins in a calendar year with five. Most bouts in a 12-month period with seven. Could you imagine seven fight camps in a 12-month period? That is savagery. He was the 2020 Mel Fighter of the Year. He is on a two-fight winning streak. He is 4-2 since 2022. Six fights already in a year and some change. 14 of his 25 wins are via knockout, 7 via submission. So 21 of his 25 wins via finish. And as usual, he has an 8-inch reach advantage. Now Jack has a boxing style. He's got a brown belt in BJJ. He's also been showing up and showing out. His last four fights have been performance of the night or fight of the night. He is on a 15-fight winning streak, 6-0 in the UFC. He is a contender series and Cage Warriors alum, and 11 of his 15 wins are via knockout. I think Jack's a great striker. I think there's a ton of potential here. I think if he's just going to try to outbox Kevin... Um, that's not going to work. I think Kevin's going to try to outbox Jack to prove a point. I like the gas taken cardio of Kevin Moore. I like his range. Jack, you know, if you're, if you're going to find an easier path to victory, it's probably grappling in the takedown like, uh, Basil Hoffest did. And, and what I call the robbery, I thought clearly beat Jack didn't get the victory, but Kevin's not going to do that. I think, uh, you know, 15 fight winning streak, 6-0 in the UFC has not fought the upper echelon in the division. There is a moment where you get humbled a little bit, and this could very well be it. It's going to be very difficult if Jack is rolling in the striking to knock out Holland. Never say never, but it, it's a very challenging feat. I just don't think Jack's going to be consistently comfortable in range. He's going to have to get in, get out. I don't think he's going to be able to sit in the pocket with Kevin and all the weird strikes and hammer fists and backhands that he likes to do. Um... He, he potentially could try to get Kevin up against the cage, just hold him there, dirty box, outscore him. But I'm not betting on that. I think Big Mouth is going to put on a show in Vegas. I'm taking the trailblazer. I am putting him on a parlay. We marking that ish down, and we getting that bread. Moving on. The main event, the rematch. We got Valentina, the bullet, Shevchenko. 35 years old with a 23-4 and four record and the number one next to her name, taking on Alexa Grasso, 30 years old with a 16-3 and three record. Now, this is a pretty highly awaited rematch. The last time Valentina was doing typical Valentina things in the, in the fight, Alexa had trained for her spinning back fist to find an opening, get her back. She got it. She did literally what she trained for. But rematches haven't gone for the long-lasting champs very well. Kamaru Usman, Israel, uh, I guess he did get the best of it, but he's lost some. Aljo lately. Uh, and more guys, they've been dethroned. Rematches haven't gone well. She is 35. She's been through a ton of fights. So it does get interesting. 
But breaking it down, Alexa has a boxing and BJJ style. She does have a brown belt in BJJ. She is the first Mexican woman to win a UFC championship. Love to see it. It was an awesome, awesome uh, showing uh, for the new champion. She is on a five-fight winning streak. She is an Invicta alum. And breaking down Valentina, give me about 30 minutes because her resume is full of everything, man. All this woman has done is competed in martial arts, fought, fight. She still seems into it. That's all she knows. She's got a Muay Thai style. She is a southpaw fighter. She's got a second Don black belt in Taekwondo, a black belt in Judo, master of sport in kickboxing, boxing, and Muay Thai. She's an eight-time world champion in Muay Thai. Not just European, not just one country, world champion. She is the former flyweight champion with seven successful title defenses. She has the most title wins in UFC women's flyweight division history with eight. The most consecutive title defenses in flyweight with seven. The first woman to even defend a UFC flyweight championship. Since the division's coming in, she's completely dominated. Tied with Caitlin Chukagian for the most UFC women's flyweight wins in division history and consecutive wins with nine and nine. Most KO wins in the flyweight division four. Longest average fight time with over 17 minutes of fight. She does fight a lot of five rounders, that's why. Most takedowns landed in UFC women's flyweight division history, 35. Most control time over an hour. Highest significant strike accuracy at 56.9, almost 57% accuracy. The fewest stripe strikes absorbed per minute, less than two at 1.67 strikes a minute. That's insane. The most total strikes landed in UFC women's flyweight division history, 1,398. The highest takedown percentage at 70%. She has victories over four former UFC champions, Holly Holm, Juliana Pena, Joanna young Jacek, and Jessica Andraj. She was the 2020, 21, and 22 Female Fighter of the Year. She was a K1 Taekwondo and Muay Thai World Champion as well. She is on a one-fight losing streak, which ended her nine-fight winning streak, and her only loss besides Amanda Nunez uh, since 2010 was Liz Carmouche, even before her UFC days. Eight of her 23 wins are via knockout, seven via submission, so 15 of her 23 wins are via finish. Again, I really do like Alexa. Her striking ability is great. I'm sure this built a ton of confidence. I am just not betting against the bullet, man. She's the bullet for a reason. She's quick. She's feisty. She's fast. She's dangerous. I just can't wait to see how motivated she is after a loss. At 35 years old, a lot of people, you could say, oh, it's the downturn. She's definitely declining. The fights have been closed. She's losing it. But Valentina eats that shit up for lunch. I think she comes out. She dominates. I'm taking the bullet. She's getting that championship belt back. I am putting her on a parlay. We marking that ish down, and we gain that bread. So somewhat of a shallow card. UFC Noche. I thought about going to Vegas because fights are the tickets are affordable compared to the pay-per-views. I am not going, though. But Kevin Holland, Jack Delegal, lead the rematch. And then next weekend, we have a decent fight night Apex card back in the old Pex. Shame for these guys. We got this headline by Rafael Faziv and Mateusz, Gam Mateusz Gamrot. That's going to be a scrap, man. Episode 15. I, I don't always want to be this guy, but I'm going to be this guy. I've been doing this podcasting thing for a while now. I rebranded. I'm putting out the reels. I'm putting in the work. If you're tuning in to Bows and TKOs, just give me a little like, a little subscribe. That will go a long ways as I try to build my channels, build the podcast following. Uh, I've been doing it every week consistently for over two years now. Um, I'm really enjoying it. I hope you guys are too. Please like and subscribe. Share it with your friends. Spread the word, man. Be a friend and spread the word. This is episode 15. Lots more to come. I'm your host, Shane Gillette. See you next week.